Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we will go through the NICE guideline on acute kidney injury, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. In this episode, we will cover the diagnosis and investigations, as well as the recommendations on the use of contrast media. In the next episode, we will cover the management recommendations by NICE and the primary care flowchart on AKI by Barnsley Hospital NHS Trust and King's College Hospital NHS Trust. So stay tuned. Right, let's jump into it. In order to identify acute kidney injury, we will check serum creatinine and compare it with baseline. AKI, acute kidney injury, is most often seen during episodes of acute illness, so we should do this screening in people with acute illness if there is pre-existing CKD or EGFR less than 60, heart failure, liver disease, diabetes, history of acute kidney injury, oliguria, that is a urine output less than 0.5 milliliters per kilo per hour, neurological or cognitive impairment or disability, which may mean limited access to fluids, hypovolemia, use of certain drugs such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aminoglycosides, ACE inhibitors, ARBs and diuretics within the past week, especially if hypovolemic, use of iodine-based contrast media within the past week, symptoms of urological obstruction, sepsis, deteriorating early warning scores, and young age or age 65 years or over. In addition, for children and young people, we should also screen for AKI if there is severe diarrhea, particularly bloody diarrhea, symptoms or signs of nephritis, such as edema, or hematuria, hematological malignancy, and hypertension. However, acute kidney injury can also happen in the absence of an acute illness. So, if there is a rise in serum creatinine, we should still consider AKI rather than a worsening of their chronic disease if there is one of the following. CKD, especially if EGFR is less than 45, urological disease or symptoms, Symptoms suggesting complications of acute kidney injury like fluid overload, oliguria, hypertension, and electrolyte imbalance. And finally, symptoms of a multi-system disease, such as, for example, the purpuric rash. There's a small risk of acute kidney injury associated with an EGFR less than 30 when having iodine-based contrast media. Iodine contrast media is commonly used in a variety of investigations such as CT scans, angiography and intravenous urography. So, how do we assess the risk of AKI in these patients? Well, before requesting a urgent CT scan with contrast, we should assess whether the person has pre-existing kidney disease. If available, we will use an EGFI measurement from the past six months. If the person has been acutely unwell or clinically unstable since their last EGFR test, we should request a more recent EGFR. If no EGFR is available from the past six months, we will ask the following screening questions. Do they have kidney disease or a kidney transplant? Have they seen or are waiting to see a nephrologist or urologist? Do they have symptoms of acute illness likely to cause acute kidney injury? such as diarrhea, vomiting, fever, hypovolemia, infection, or difficulty passing urine? If the answer to any of these screening questions is yes, then we should request a new EGFR. However, if the screening questions do not indicate a problem and the person is clinically stable, NICE says that we could consider proceeding without the need for further blood tests before the scan. However, in practice and as a safety measure, it is likely that we will request the EGFR anyway, just in case. In order to prevent and reduce the risk of AKI, we will encourage oral hydration before and after procedures using intravenous iodine-based contrast media. In addition, we will consider temporarily stopping ACE inhibitors and ARBs if they have CKD with an EGFR less than 30. NICE has produced a one-page visual summary on assessing the risk of AKI in adults having iodine-based contrast media. 
and I have put a link to it in the episode description. Now, how do we prevent deterioration in people with acute kidney injury or at high risk of it? Well, we will obviously use our clinical judgment, follow prescribing recommendations in our electronic clinical systems, and consider optimizing medication, such as stopping nephrotoxic drugs and adjusting doses according to renal function. We should also consider temporarily stopping ACE inhibitors and ARBs in people with diarrhea, vomiting or sepsis until they have improved. So, we screen for AKI by checking renal function on a blood test. But how do we actually diagnose acute kidney injury? Well, we will use any of the following criteria. A fall in urine output to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for more than 6 hours in adults and more than 8 hours in children and young people. A rise in creatinine of 26 micromoles per liter or greater within 48 hours. A 50% or greater rise in creatinine known or presumed to be within the past 7 days or a 25% or greater fall in EGFR in those aged under 18 years within the past seven days. There is also an algorithm that we can follow for early identification of acute kidney injury. However, it is fairly complex, so I will not go through it here. You can find a link to it in the episode description. We will obviously monitor creatine regularly in those with AKI or at risk of it. The frequency of monitoring should vary according to clinical need. In terms of investigations, in order to identify the cause of AKI, NICE recommends that we should do a urine dipstick for urinalysis as soon as possible and take appropriate action when results are abnormal. For example, we should think about the diagnosis of acute nephritis when there is no obvious cause for the AKI and the urine dipstick shows hematuria and proteinuria without a UTI or trauma due to catheterization. We should not routinely request an ultrasound scan if the cause of the AKI is known. However, if there is no identified cause for the AKI or the patient is at risk of urinary tract obstruction, the patient should have an urgent ultrasound within 24 hours. So in practice, these patients are likely to need referral to the emergency department. This is even more so when pyonephrosis, that is, an infected and obstructed kidney, is suspected, given that the ultrasound should be performed within six hours in these cases. So that is it, a review of the NICE guideline on AKI covering the diagnosis and initial investigations. Make sure not to miss the next episode, where we will cover the management recommendations. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.